Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and begin. It's, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, a uh, panel discussion entitled Dartmouth 64s in the Vietnam War. Uh, my name is Edward Miller. I teach in the Department of History here at Dartmouth. Uh, and I'm also the instructor for History 26, the Vietnam War, and this, this panel is, is, is being presented as, as part of that, that course that I'm teaching right now. We're here tonight to explore a little bit of Dartmouth history and also a little bit of American history. Uh, like countless other institutions in this country, Dartmouth College was profoundly affected by the conflict known as the Vietnam War. Uh, during the early 1960s, most Americans perceived the Vietnam War as a very far away episode in the larger geopolitical clash known as the Cold War. But after 1965, after U.S. President Lyndon Johnson made the decision to send hundreds of thousands of U.S. military personnel to South Vietnam and also to begin a strategic bombing cam campaign against North Vietnam, American attitudes about this war began to change. During the late 1960s, the war evolved into a bitter struggle on the U.S. home front, not only in Vietnam, and it divided Americans as no issue had since the U.S. Civil War a century earlier. For both supporters and opponents, the war in Vietnam became a touchstone issue, not only in debates about U.S. foreign policy, but also in clashes over politics, culture, and morality at home. In this panel, we're going to be exploring just little bits and pieces of this history. We're going to be looking at some of the particular intersections between Dartmouth history and the larger history of the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War era. Uh, however, we're going to do this in a, in a very personal way. We're going to be doing it via the experiences and testimony of our five panelists, all of whom are both Vietnam veterans and members of the Dartmouth class of 64. Uh, now, the way this is going to work, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in turn and give them just a couple of minutes to, to introduce themselves, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience to, to, uh, to questions and, and discussion. Uh, but before I do that, I need to thank just a couple of people who have, uh, who have made this event happen. Uh, first of all, I need to thank the members of the entire Dartmouth class of 1964. Uh, not just the five men up here with me on stage, but the, the entire class. Uh, for the last three years, the class of 64 has displayed extraordinary support for History 26, and, and they've co-sponsored this event. This is actually the third time that, that th this panel on uh, Dartmouth 64s in the Vietnam War has been held. Uh, I'd like in particular to thank uh, Ray Peters, who is currently the president of the class of 1964. Uh, Ray could not be here tonight, unfortunately, but he's been a very strong supporter of me, my teaching, and my students, and especially the students in, in History 26, many of whom are, are present here tonight. Uh, among other things, Ray has made it possible for every student who's currently enrolled in History 26 to receive a copy of this book, Dartmouth Veterans Vietnam Perspectives. This is a book uh, that was published last year. It is a collection of essays mostly by members of the class of 64 who served in the military during the, the Vietnam era. All five of, of our panelists contributed to this volume. If you don't already have a copy of this, I, I urge you to, uh, to get a, a hold of it. It's available on Amazon. Um, I did write the introduction, but I am not receiving royalties from this book, okay? So <laughs> just be clear about that. Uh, the other person that I need to thank here uh, at the outset is uh, Mr. Phil Schaefer. Um, Phil is also a member of the class of 1964, and he is basically the true puppet master behind this event. Um, it was Phil who first proposed the idea for this panel uh, three years ago when he was auditing History 26, and, and he's been the, the, the driving force and, and has, has proposed and sustained all kinds of collaborations involving me and my students in the class. So, so Phil, on, on behalf of all the students in History 26, let me thank you for your, your contributions. Okay, I'm, as I said, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists uh, in turn, and we're, we're going to go in, in alphabetical order here. Uh, starting to my immediate left, uh, Mr. Lee Chilcote. Uh, Mr. Chilcote is a native and current resident of Cleveland, Ohio. At Dartmouth, he started out in the Naval ROTC program, but ended up commissioning as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps. He served in Vietnam in the Marines from February 1966 and commanded a Marine platoon in multiple operations in both Guangnam and Guangxi provinces. Uh, after leaving the Marine Corps in March of 1967, Mr. Chilcote became a lawyer, and he has worked at that capacity in his native Cleveland ever since. Uh, he's also served the Cleveland community in many nonprofit and philanthropic leadership positions. 
Please join me in welcoming Lee back to Dartmouth. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, what Professor Miller has asked each of us to do is to bring our background down to a little more personal level so that you can get to know us. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything about the essay or anything that I said in the book, but rather just talk about myself a little bit so you can get a better sense of me. Um, as he indicated, I, uh, like many of you, graduated from Dartmouth. I went to engineering school. I um, graduated from Thayer, uh, tried to balance work between uh, Navy ROTC courses and um, taking English and engineering science all at the same time. It's not possible, so. Um, uh, but anyways, came out in 65, was in Tuck School, dropped out of Tuck School and respected the Commandant's request that I go on active duty. Um, the was commissioned, and as you realize, I went directly to Vietnam, spent a tour there, came out in March of 67, uh, went on to the uh, Mediterranean for a cruise, and then the Caribbean, was stationed at Camp Lejeune on the East Coast, and Treasure Island on the West Coast at Camp Pendleton, and that's a short synopsis of the military side of it. Um, when I came out of the service, I realized uh, one of the really important things that I had gained was an ability to trust others that you don't know. It's uh, an amazing experience to be in the military, and one of the things that uh, happens to you is you're forced into a situation where you have no choice. Uh, in a lot of cases, I was working with men uh, who had not had much education, had not had many opportunities in life, often came from the inner city, and were thrust into the exact same situation that I was thrust in. So that tends to change your perspective and view of things. And um, because we want to keep this very short, I just want to say some things personally about what I think I learned from that whole experience. And then hopefully this will provoke some questions from all of you. Um, the first instinct I had coming out of the military service was to give back to our society. And that may seem strange having uh, understood that I spent so much time in the military. But that sense of giving back led to a lot of things in my life. Um, it, um, I, um, I developed an ability uh, to really be, have concern for others. I came up from a pretty, pretty upper crust background. I didn't get too much exposure to diversity here at Dartmouth in those days. There were a lot of people who went to East Coast, East Coast boarding schools at that time. So uh, one thing that happened is whatever elitist background I had disappeared real quick because I learned um, what American citizens were really all about. Um, obviously, you learn to do the right thing, uh, and there's a lot of choices to be made when you're in the military or when you're in these situations, uh, and that's a life learning. Um, family and friends first is another one, and while these things seem simple, the last one is, I think, what has driven me most of my life, and it's, um, it's just to keep going. It's perseverance. It's incredible what a group of people can do if they choose to do it. And one thing you learn in the military is that perseverance and determination are what keep you alive. So I'm just going to stop right there. I think that's all I got to say for right now. Thanks, Lee. Our second panelist tonight is Glenn Kendall. Uh, Glenn is a native of Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, as a high school senior, Glenn's choice for colleges came down to, to two institutions, Dartmouth or the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he chose Dartmouth, uh, but at Dartmouth, he, uh, he served in the Army ROTC and ended up commissioning as a second lieutenant and at that point had plans to make a career in the Army. Um, he initially served in Germany in an airborne infantry battalion. He was subsequently promoted to captain. He arrived in Vietnam in June of 1967, uh, was assigned to a light infantry brigade, brigade operating then um, in central Vietnam outside of Hue. 
After his service in Vietnam, Glenn returned to Dartmouth to attend the Tuck School of Business, so he's a Tuckie as well as a Dartmouth alum. He subsequently worked in the Nixon White House, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. In 1977, he founded a consulting firm, uh, which subsequently became a, a software firm, I understand. So um, uh, Glenn is now retired, but he continues to work as the administrator of Calcutta Rescue, an Indian charity that supports poor people in Calcutta with medical, educational, and other services. Please join me in welcoming Glenn. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to say is this course, this history course, is fantastic. Those of you who are taking it don't know how really fortunate you are to do it. And I wish there were courses like this all over the country. Um, my, I, I'm assuming that most of you have read my essay so you know my story. I went to Vietnam, I assumed command of an infantry company. We participated in several uh, incidents of combat, a couple times quite heavy. We suffered casualties. Um, and, and I was good at my job, and the, the uh, troops who worked under me were fantastic. A bit more about that in a moment. One night we had a really heavy encounter, we lost a lot of guys. Uh, my motivation for all this was always I was going to make to help make the world free for democracy. And after this encounter, uh, I was sitting there, and I realized that's not the way to make the world free for democracy. And I submitted my resignation. Uh, as a regular army officer. Uh, it was um, uh, an insignificant piece of real estate with a bunch of young guys trying to kill each other for probably reasons that we didn't really understand. And the, co the consequences, no matter what the outcome was, were totally insignificant. And I came to the conclusion after that the war in Vietnam was a stupid war. Um, that doesn't mean that the, the soldiers who participated there were stupid or unpatriotic in any way. Uh, echoing what Lee said, uh, my company was about 90% Afro-Americans. They came from Watts and Harlem. Many of them had been told that they either join the army or go to jail. Uh, and they were great soldiers, fantastic. So uh, <coughs> the soldiers were not the, the reason that we had, had problems. Um, the, uh, what I want, what I hope we can do as a result of our experience in Vietnam was not to have any more stupid wars. And I think there are several things we have to do to achieve that. One is we have to have a strong military. If we have a weak military, people are just going to come rolling over us. And then we have to have the wisdom and the courage and the patience to not use that military until it's absolutely necessary to do so. Uh, and that's where courses like this history course help us remember that it's easy to go into one of these wars, and it costs us for the rest of our lives, not just in money, but in, in diminished lives and broken families and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the other thing is that we need, we need Dartmouth graduates to be politicians. Well, you guys go out and run for Congress so we get some wisdom in Congress and so we don't do these stupid wars anymore. That's that, uh, we need to get some wisdom into that, into that process. So. Um, uh, I was asked today whether, uh, whether I thought that working for this charity in India uh, was a result of uh, somehow uh, alleviating my guilt conscience for what I did in Vietnam. I never really thought about that before. You mentioned it. Um, it must have had something to do with it, but uh, I'm glad I've had that opportunity. I look forward to your questions, and please ask hard questions. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Our third panelist this evening is Jim Laughlin. Uh, Jim is also a graduate of the Army ROTC program here at Dartmouth. Uh, Jim subsequently chose to take a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve in the intelligence branch. Uh, he then decided to delay fulfilling his two-year term of service so he could attend law school at the University of Michigan. Upon graduating with his law degree in 1967, he reported for active duty and was subsequently assigned to work in military intelligence in Vietnam, where he arrived in December 1967, uh, just in time to experience the Tet Offensive, which, as History 26 students know, began in January of 1968. Or you will know that. That's in the lecture on Friday. So <laughs> you are taking notes. Um, Jim subsequently ended up uh, moving down to the Mekong Delta, where he ended up serving as an aerial reconnaissance commander. He eventually flew a total of 77 <laughs> recon missions. Uh, after leaving the Army, Jim worked as assistant legal counsel at Princeton University 
Uh, he then went into private practice in New Jersey. Uh, Jim is currently retired. He lives in Florida with his wife, Pam, who is uh, here with him tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> As with Glenn, I assume you've read my essay, which starts at page 249 of our wonderful <laughs> publication. Uh, I'm kind of a Dartmouth success story. I was the first person in my family ever to go to college. Can you hear me? No. I'm sorry. I'm something of a Dartmouth success story in that I was the first person in... This electronic stuff baffles me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try again. I was the first person in my family ever to go to college. When my mother went to enroll in grade school, she couldn't speak a word of English, and to her dying day could not pronounce the, the, the title of this institution. It always came out Dartmouth. But uh, I, I'm, unlike my colleagues, when I graduated, I made the decision to take a delay in going on active duty. The wisdom of that decision is still to be determined because when I was sent to Vietnam, I had absolutely no training and no troop time. They knew I was not going to stay in the Army, so I and six other attorneys who graduated from the infantry school together were summarily shipped off on a plane and parceled out to fill officer slots for which we were probably not qualified. But having gone to this school, you, dis you discover an amazing thing. You're able to cope with problems and solve them and learn jobs while on the job as opposed to going through a formal training program. Sometimes the training that the Army gave was worse than, than actually doing it with no training at all. So I'll, uh, <laughs> with, that, I'll, uh, with that, I will turn the matter back to Professor Miller and I hope that you ask us some very difficult questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Jim. Uh, our fourth panelist is uh, Bud McGrath. Um, Bud at Dartmouth also uh, participated in the Army ROTC program. Uh, he received a regular Army commission upon graduation, ended up serving for four years in the Army. Uh, Bud hoped to serve initially in an artillery unit in Germany, and he initially got what he wanted. Uh, however, his European tour ended up being cut short due, due to the expanding war in Vietnam. He was sent to Vietnam in 1967 and was also stationed there uh, during the, the Tet Offensive of 1968. Uh, after leaving the Army, Bud began his graduate studies in English literature at the University of Texas at Austin. He received his PhD there in 1973, and he has gone on to have a very successful career uh, as an academic, as a professor of, of English. He is currently professor of English at the University of Southern Maine. Please join me in welcoming Bud McGrath. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, the point that um, Ed, Ed is making about us all being in ROTC, <clears throat> it shows that um, one of the reasons that we were in that, speaking for myself certainly, is that we were draft dodgers. And uh, we were in ROTC mainly to avoid the draft uh, because um, we wanted to have some control over <clears throat> uh, what we did, where we served, and so forth. And <clears throat> my big plan, as, um, as Ed pointed out, was to, to uh, be in the artillery and to spend my time in, uh, in Germany. But all of that changed um, once they started the, the buildup in Vietnam. And I remember um, the first... Uh, oh, um, the first... Uh, <clears throat> time I got my orders was not to go to Vietnam, actually, but I cut short my term in Germany. And um, I was sent to a place in Arizona, and I looked at the name of it, and I couldn't pronounce it. Um, and it turned out it was Fort Huachuca, uh, which is in southern Arizona, and it's actually uh, a fort that was originally built to uh, hunt down Cochise um, in the southwest. Um, but in any case, I, um, I went to Vietnam uh, after the year at Huachuca, and um, I was, you know, like everyone else that went over there, uh, fairly naive about why we were there, uh, what we were supposed to be doing. Um, but it became clear um, uh, after um, my tour there 
that we weren't accomplishing very much. And so I had a very different attitude toward the war at the end. And I think if you read most of the essays that are, are in the book, um, a lot of us <coughs> were, went to Vietnam with a sort of a positive fra frame of mind, but, the, um, but most of us came back uh, very skeptical about the war and, uh, and what it was accomplishing. Um, and in fact, um, while I was in graduate school, um, I did participate in some anti-war activities myself, um, and particularly when Nixon um, uh, started to bomb uh, Cambodia, there was a huge uh, march that, um, that I participated in. In preparing my, um, <clears throat> to, do, to do my essay for that book, um, I got onto Google Earth and tried to locate some of the places that, um, that I had been in, um, in Vietnam. I was in a, at a base camp um, that was about 15 miles northeast of, uh, of Saigon. And I had also spent some time in a forward operation in a small uh, town of Swanlock, which um, it turned out to be uh, not while I was there, but in uh, in 1975, that was sort of the last big battle of the uh, between the North uh, and the South. And after the Battle of Swanlock, um, they um, uh, the North Vietnamese Army was able to move without resistance um, on um, on Saigon. Uh, but to get back to my point about <coughs> looking at, at the map. The, the military bases where I was, and uh, outside of Saigon and Swanlong, I, I had trouble finding them. Um, I was looking for these, you know, uh, open splotches of earth uh, that no longer existed. They were mostly industrial uh, compounds uh, at this point, and so and um, so many of our former military bases, in fact, now are industrial complexes. And Vietnam has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And it's also, uh, Vietnam has become one of our primary, uh, one, of our, one of our trading partners. Um, and um, so <coughs> that puts a totally new perspective on the domino theory, which was what was put forth uh, as our rationale for being there, and that a lot of us bought into that, that went there. But um, you know, the question I have is, you know, how much sooner would uh, Vietnam have the a growing economy that it has now, and um, the success has it achieved? Uh, had we not been there, then maybe it would have happened, you know, ten years sooner. Thank you, Bud. Our last uh, panelist this evening is Neil Stanley. Neil is a native of Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, he is also a graduate of Dartmouth's Army ROTC program and therefore apparently a draft dodger. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Um, Neil spent the first three years of his Army service as an officer in, the armored ca in an armored cavalry regiment patrolling the front lines of the European Cold War. So like Bud, he was also stationed in Germany. Uh, in 1967, he received orders to go to Vietnam, and there he served as an advisor to a South Vietnamese Army unit. And as students in History 26 know, this is an important and distinctive part of the American experience, the uh, military involvement in Vietnam, is, is the advisory support provided to the, the South Vietnamese Army. Um, he arrived in early 1968 in the midst of the Tet Offensive. It had already begun, and uh, he served there for a year, leaving in February of 1969. Uh, since completing his military service, Neil has had a long and successful career in insurance management. He has served as the president of three insurance companies. Uh, Neil and his wife, Morella, who is, who is here with us uh, this evening, currently live in California and in South Carolina. Uh, please join me in welcoming Neil back to Dartmouth. Uh, good evening. It's great to be here. It's nice to see all of these faces, uh, the green ones up in the front. I remember when I was in ROTC, um, I was the guy that uh, wouldn't cut his hair, uh, wouldn't shine his shoes, and, uh, and, and basically uh, they, my commanding officer and others were really concerned about me. 
Um, I went on to summer camp and I figured, well, what the heck, if I'm here, I might as well try to do a good job and, and ended up second in my class. Not just, it, it really goes to show that you can, you can do it if you really want to. And that gave me the right uh, to select whether or not I wanted to be a reserve officer or a regular officer. And like most of us sitting here on the panel, um, we didn't come from backgrounds that afforded us a lot of money. So that was my only way that I felt I could get to Europe and I really wanted to go to Europe. So I took the regular army commission, uh, which meant one more year. And at that time, I figured it was 1964, um, that should be fairly easy. I should be able to get out in three years and I could go to, I could go to Germany as opposed to going to Korea. And the first three years of my tour in, or my time in the service was exactly that. I had a great, great opportunity, had a real mission to complete with the, uh, the unit that I was in in, in Germany. And then uh, I got orders, and the orders were for the 101st uh, Airborne Division uh, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, fortunately, at that time, I was on leave. I didn't hear, I didn't hear the call over uh, the Army network, so I didn't, uh, I didn't manage to get there for that. Uh, instead, they, they sent me to, uh, uh, they sent me to uh, 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 school and language school. That's the reason I'm having trouble remembering this because <laughs> I, I, I have a <laughs> real defect, and the defect is I'm tone deaf. And, and trying to speak Vietnamese, if you can't speak a tonal language, is very, very difficult. <laughs> and I had a, a few funny experiences when I was over there. But I'm going to go back to a point that we were all, when I was going through my initial training, we were all sitting around the table in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, all being about five of us were sitting around the table in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And at that time, we were either just about to turn 21 or were 21. It was the first time we had an opportunity to vote. And we had a choice at that particular time between Barry Goldwater and, uh, and Lyndon Johnson. And we all made the decision at that particular point in time, at that moment, and I can remember it clearly, that we were going to vote for Lyndon Johnson because he would keep us out of Vietnam. <laughs> Since that point in time, I have had an absolute distrust, distrust for any politician, regardless of party, <laughs> race, or gender. And it, 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 it was really true. At that particular point in time, there were about 23,000 uh, American troops in South Vietnam. By the time I went in 1968, there were over 500,000 troops in Vietnam. So you can see the escalation of our presence during that period of time. Uh, as all the rest of the panelists have, have mentioned, uh, we, we, each of us, uh, came away from the war with a completely different perspective. I think, on the other hand, every single, uh, than we did when we, we, we started there. Perhaps we thought that we were there for a great reason, but in reality, we were in the midst of a civil war. We had chosen, as a country, to support a regime that was basically corrupt. And that was clear to us when we were there. I was an advisor. I knew that absolutely and clearly when I was there. The province chief that, that, that was in the province that I was in uh, took his best troops. Those troops defended his territory. The food, the goods, and everything that we provided to be sent to the peasants, basically, in Vietnam with hands crossed, showing that we were there to support them, were stored in his yard, and then sold to the people that they were intended to go to for, for nothing. It was pretty clear to us that we were on the wrong side, not on the wrong side, we were supporting the wrong side. And it would made our mission extremely difficult because that's what, that's what it's all about. It's about your mission. And you have to believe in that mission. And it was very difficult to believe in something when you could see firsthand evidence that it was not clear to us why we were there and not clear to the people why we were there. So it was a difficult time. On the other hand, I think each one of us, and I especially, learned a tremendous amount. I learned a tremendous amount from the people that I was with in Vietnam. 
I have tremendous respect for them and, and, and the hardships that they have endured and did endure to be where they are today. Uh, I in, uh, a few panelists mentioned the, the young men, in that, and it was mostly almost all young men at that time, that were with us in Vietnam, uh, for the most part, not well educated, difficult for them to understand why they were there and what they were doing. I learned so much for them as well. And it was a pleasure to be able to see them grow and develop those of, the, those of them that really made it. I think none of us really, we came back um, injured in our own way. It took me 15 to 20 years before I really wanted to talk about the experiences I had there. And I think that's pretty clear from each one of us that, we, that sat up here that were in combat. It's a difficult time. It's not playing a video game. It's not doing any of those types of things. When the man next to you gets his face shot off and you've been talking to him two minutes before, that's reality. So it's hard. And your memories stick with you. And thank God for the work that's being done today for the soldiers that are coming back, uh, that they're being treated and treated well. That wasn't the case so much for our group. Thank you, Neil. Okay, we are going to open up the, uh, the floor for questions now. Uh, we have a couple of, of mobile microphones, so uh, if, you, if you have a question, if you could raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you, and if you could just wait to ask your question until you actually uh, get the microphone. Um, a, a couple of things uh, about the questions before we begin here. Um, because we do have a fairly large panel, insofar as you're able to target your question, if you're able to ask a, a particular member or a particular couple members of the panel, I think that will, that will help us get as many questions in as possible. Um, and uh, also, if you could uh, please uh, identify yourself, just your, your name, and if you're a, a Dartmouth student, your, your class, that would be great, okay? Um, so in, in, in keeping with Dartmouth tradition, uh, the first uh, few questions at least will, will go to students. So, so who would like to start us off, please? All right, uh, Lulu in the middle there. Um, hi, I'm Lulu Carter. I'm a sophomore at Dartmouth, obviously. Seems really stupid now that it came out of my mouth. Um, and um, I'm promptly going to ignore <laughs> Professor Miller what you just said about making, trying to specify one person on the panel. Um, my first instinct when I meet a veteran, and most of the vets I've met have been um, typically from Vietnam, um, is to say thank you for your service. And last week we had um, Professor Christian Appy from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst come speak to us, and he cautioned us against doing so and against universally lionizing veterans for having served. And he asked or suggested instead that we say, tell me about your service. Um, and I was wondering if th there were any strong opinions or opinions in general from this panel that maybe would care to speak to that. Because I'm really confused and I would like some guidance. <laughs> do we want to lionize the veterans or do we want them to tell their story? Can you repeat the question? Yes. So the, the, the question is, um, we, we had a visitor to History 26 last week, Professor Christian Appy, and he was, he was talking about the, the contemporary practice of, of lionizing veterans for uh, their military service, simply for the fact of, of serving. And, and he cautioned against the common practice of, of people saying thank you for their service, is thank you for your service to veterans as sort of a, a kind of throwaway line. And he suggested instead that uh, we, we ask veterans, tell me about your service as a way of opening up a, a, a conversation and a, a more interactive exchange. And uh, Lulu's wondering what the, the panel thinks of this. Uh, I think he's absolutely correct. It's um, thank you for your service is nothing. <laughs> it's. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we were talking a bit earlier about this. When we came back, there was a very strong anti-war movement going on. Lee was telling me just a minute ago that some a vet got off of a plane in Chicago, got shot. Was it Chicago? And he had, because by an anti-war protester, and there was uh, uh, violent uh, vets were spit upon and called baby killers and things like that. 
uh, my own personal experience, nobody, my family says they were, they told my family we were not supposed to talk to him about his experience. I didn't have a chance to talk about my war experience for 10 years. Um, and it's, it's um, uh, it, 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 if you can do it, listen to what the vets have to say. It's, uh, they have good stories and bad stories, and, but uh, thank you for your services. Nothing. <coughs> I guess I jump in here. Um, I think it's pretty hard for a lot of veterans when they're close to their service. To, so that question probably is going to be met with a pretty short answer. Um, but if you, uh, I suppose the, the real answer is that it would be excellent if those questions were asked because it's best for the veterans. Uh, they're the ones uh, who are reluctant to tell their stories and they're the ones that should tell their stories. Um, I like to do that in terms of what it has done, what military service did for me. And, and I said this earlier, it really converted me from someone who had lived a life without much challenge. Everything I had done in my life had been done well and I succeeded. When I got in the military, not everything was successful. And that life lesson has stuck with me all these years. So. And I imagine that's true for every veteran, um, that this kind of uh, experience just changes your life. So it is a positive experience. I don't care whether it was Vietnam or what war it was. It's a positive experience, and, and keeping that approach helps the veterans and should help you. I think um, <coughs> when we came back, because of the animosity in the anti-war movement, um, I mean, we all had different experiences, but I, I went, I was discharged, and a week later I was in graduate school. And, um, you know, people knew I had just come out of the military, and uh, I had just come from Vietnam, and nobody ever broached the subject with me. Um, and that was true of my family, too, actually. I mean, uh, nobody in my family really asked me about about it at all. And, and quite frankly, um, I don't think I was ready to talk about it. Um, I, when, I, when I flew back on the plane uh, from Vietnam, I, I just wanted to leave it behind and, uh, and forget about it. Um, and of course, you don't forget about it, um, but, um, but it, you know, it, it, was, it was, I don't know how you get around both uh, at, at that time, the, the the reluctance of people to talk about experiences like that, and um, also in our particular uh, situation, the the hostility that you could sense, you know, I mean, from some people who disapproved of the war and therefore disapproved of, you know, your particular role in it. I, just a bit of Dartmouth history. I was Tuck seventy one. And in the, in the spring of 71, the anti-war protesters occupied the president's office at Dartmouth. Um, final exams were canceled. Uh, and basically, the university was shut down by the anti-war protests. And ROTC was abolished. Another question. Caitlin, you had your, your hand up. Um, I'm Caitlin. I'm a 16, or so a junior. Um, my question is to all of you, but Mr. Stanley, because Mr. Stanley, you spoke to this in your introduction. I was wondering how much exposure you had to the um, South Vietnamese forces, um, and like how much you interacted with them, or whether you just interacted with U.S. military. Uh, as an advisor, uh, I spent all my time with the Vietnamese. Uh, there was no, uh, when I first got to Vietnam, uh, I, was, I was down in the Delta, which is the f uh, down in the four, cor uh, four cores, uh, as it was referred to then. Uh, we were, the unit that I was attached to was the 44th Special Tactical Zone. We had five advisors. Uh, there were three battalions, uh, uh, one Ranger Battalion and two Arvin Battalions. Um, I was the operations officer. Uh, and I spent all my time with the uh, with the with the Vietnamese people. Uh, 
either with them <coughs> individually uh, in, in combat situations or with their families when I came back. And that was uh, when I'd come back off of those uh, combat because the families actually live with them. Uh, they, uh, in conditions that were pretty, pretty difficult for us to understand. Um, for example, um, uh, they would live in a, a room about, uh, about 10 foot square, and four families would live in that room separated by blankets. And, and these were officers. Uh, the the uh, enlisted people slept uh, in bunkers in the ground with their families. It was a very difficult situation. And you learn to appreciate significantly the culture, what they were going through, and uh, it, it changed me significantly. Uh, I've got some funny stories about, about my, my experience with them, uh, but for the overall, for all the people that I met, they were warm, loving people who just wanted one thing, and that was peace. Can, can you tell us perhaps one of those, those stories, <laughs> funny or otherwise? Oh, I have one in the book, and you can read, you, uh, you can read that. I'll, I'll tell another story. It's about my, my lack of ability to speak Vietnamese, and I tried. Um, but I would, my, uh, I would have my clothes washed uh, by, uh, I'd go down to the village and I'd have them wash my clothes. And washing the clothes meant taking them, my uniforms down to the river, and they would put the, put the clothes in the river and beat them with rocks to get them clean, sort of. And then they would come back and they would iron them, and normally the husband was ironing the clothes, and he had, uh, he had a big cast iron iron, and they'd put hot rocks in the iron and iron the clothes. And I, uh, I tried to be friendly, and I, I went up one day to get my clothes, and I told the woman, who was his wife, how, how beautiful she looked today. Unfortunately, it came out that I had insulted her terribly. <laughs> um, I had my interpreter with me. Um, he was a delightful guy. He, he, would la he was laughing. He, was, he knew exactly what I was trying to say, but he was laughing. Well, the man was not happy with me at all. He jumped over the, over the front of the, the thing and started chasing me around the village square uh, with his great big iron in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the people in the village were laughing. First of all, they were very concerned about what I had done. And then my interpreter, Tron, uh, explained to them what I was doing. Then everyone was laughing, and finally the man stopped chasing me, and he started laughing, and so that's, <laughs> but that's, those are the kinds of things that happen. So what did you say to them? Uh, I didn't say anything, I just <laughs> nodded my head and smiled. <laughs> Great, another question. We had a hand up right here, <clears throat> front row. Would you, you just wait for the microphone. Where's? There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, gentlemen, thank you so much um, for coming here. We're so excited um, to, be to, be, to be able to hear you all speak. Um, I heard multiple times by multiple speakers talking about how strange and disorienting it was to be dropped into um, a combat situation or other um, with the military, having a Dartmouth background, being from an elitist background that was so like disparate from the background of your soldiers. So we wanted to, and I think like this is something that as cadets um, we think about often is how are we going to bridge that gap? How are we going to be able to connect and use the um, good things that we've learned from this institution and not have that be such a separating factor. So I want to sort of, you know, ask you all for your advice on how you all manage to connect with your soldiers despite being from, you know, such a unique place. Thank you. Um, I might respond to that. Uh, I feel lucky to have been in the Marine Corps because one of the principles of the Marine Corps was is that you need to get as close to your men and be as much like them, and, and your leadership is a quiet courage, uh, something that is expected of Marine officers. There isn't a separation between the Marine officers and the men, as there may be in other services. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a taught form of leadership. So one of the things that I think about is that um, 
is ex experience. Uh, I wish I had done my military service before I went to Dartmouth, because had I done that, I think I would have celebrated the experience here and, and, and taken value out of the experience here in a way that I did not. Um, uh, so uh, that's not a choice for any of you, but I will say that as much experience as you can get outside of the college before you finish your college is, is to me, a, a key. Um, that's, that's what I would say. I'll, I'll give you one piece of advice that my father gave me. He was in the Second World War uh, when I was in the service. And he said one thing, trust your sergeant. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're smart, you've spent a lot of time, you, you understand things, but you don't understand what it's like uh, in that combat situation or even in, a, even in a garrison situation. Trust your sergeant to be able to help you. That person is experienced, he's been there, he's seen it, he's done it. The second part is take care of the troops that are, you're responsible for first. Eat last. Make sure all of them are fed. An army moves on its stomach. You've heard that lots of times, but it's absolutely true. Make sure that they're fed. Make sure that they, they, they can sleep and do the things that they need to do. They will follow you when they believe that you believe in them and trust them. Try not to be, take yourself, and, and just as Lee said, put yourself in a different position. Uh, you're going you're gonna to win, they're going to win if you take care of them. And your job is to take care of them and make sure that they get out of this alive. I think that, that another thing that's really important is you've got to be really, really competent in your soldierly skills. Uh, we're out in the middle of the jungle and the, the, the infantrymen just complain. That's, if they're not complaining, you've got a problem. They just complain all the time until somebody starts shooting at you and then they stop. And the, the, the complaints are that my radio call sign, they called me Delta Six. That was my radio call sign. Delta Six doesn't know where the hell he is. We're lost. We're going the wrong way. When are we going to just complaining, complaining all the time? Those map reading skills are absolutely essential. Calling for and are uh, adjusting artillery fire, uh, all of those skills that which you'll learn is through your training, really pay attention to it because they know when you make a mistake. They know real fast, and that's a, all of these other pieces of advice are also very important, but competence, and you, you guys have enough intelligence to learn those skills. I had no trouble in my relations with the enlisted men under my command because I always treated them with respect, which is what they wanted and deserved. Uh, so I think that that's important, and as graduates of this institution, you bring a certain leavening experience to the officer corps that the professional military officer does not bring to the table. And so many of these professional officers like to throw their weight around that it creates bad relationships and consequently problems with the units and their viability to function in combat under stressful situations. Yeah, I would just reiterate that. Uh, fortunately for me, I made my mistakes before I went to Vietnam. Um, and, um, you, you, you know, in my unit there, I had a couple of warrant officers, a lieutenant and a master sergeant, um, who were all completely competent. And when you have completely competent people, the best thing you can do is just to stay out of their way and let them do their job. Um, and occasionally you, you do have to, if you've got somebody that's not doing their job, then you have to know, uh, as Glenn has pointed out, you have to know their job as well as your own and, um, and, and show them how to do it. But never, and another thing you need to do is never publicly humiliate anybody. If you need to, um, and, you know, talk to somebody about their performance, you know, do it in private. Good question. Another question? Yes, Addy. Hi, I'm Addy. I'm a senior. Um, I actually have a question for Mr. Laughlin. Uh, in your essay, you kind of talk about the anti-war protests at Princeton and how you reacted, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you and the university approached these protests and what your thoughts on them were. 
Yes, the, the question was, in your essay, you referenced after you served in Vietnam, you worked at Princeton, and one of your, your tasks there was to uh, react to the, the anti-war protests. The administration at Princeton had to react to anti-war protests on campus. So the, the question was, wh what did you do, and, and what was your, your thoughts about the, the anti-war protests? Well, was it Princeton yes. The job at Princeton was a great job, and I got along very well with my supervising attorney. Uh, the job terminated as a result of the Vietnam War. In 1971, the campus demonstrations became extremely violent and widespread across this country. And one day, a, an agitator, I believe his name was Stephen Burlingame, who had no connection with the university whatsoever, led a protest march, which resulted in the firebombing of the Institute for Defense Analysis. And then the crew decided to try to burn down Nassau Hall. Well, Nassau Hall was built in 1756. It's the oldest academic building in the United States, and at the time that it opened, it was the largest academic building in the United States. <coughs> and nonetheless, Burlingame and the students who joined him were trying to throw Molotov cocktails to ignite the structure. <coughs> I mean, give me a break. <laughs> This is a historic institution. It's like trying to, you would try to bomb Dartmouth Hall. And you're talking about a structure that's been existing for centuries, the floors of which were hallowed by centuries of the tread of proper Princetonian little feet. <laughs> <laughs> As a result of that demonstration, the president of the university, who was named Robert Goheen, co convened a joint faculty-staff conference, and we went as members of the professional staff of the university, and he launched into a speech where he kept repeating that we needed to respect the rights of the students to civil disobedience and to protest this horrible war and to express themselves as they saw fit. And after a while, my boss couldn't take it any longer, so he threw his hand up in the air and he said, excuse me, Mr. President. I'm the attorney for this university, and I'm as much in favor of free speech and freedom of expression as anyone in this world. But that doesn't give these students and their agitators the right to go running around the campus throwing firebombs at buildings and yelling, burn, baby, burn. Well, there was a deadly silence that hit the room, and Goheen finished his speech. And we walked out the door, and he turned to me, and he said, I'm sorry I did that, Jim. I said, why, Larry? I thought you were right on the money. He said, yeah, but I just cost us our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, nah, that can't be, Larry. This is Princeton, the bastion of free speech and freedom of expression. Well, two weeks later, both he and I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of my experience at Princeton. <laughs> Another question for the panel. Yes, Chi. Hi, uh, my name is Chi. I'm a 16. And, um, I mean, there's just one thing that I noticed from most of your introduction that you said that you first came to Vietnam thinking that you were fighting for the right thing. And then after a while, you realize that, uh, okay, it's kind of meaningless to be here. So I just wonder how long did it take you during your 12 months there to realize that it was wrong to, f well, it was not okay to be there? And was there any like specific moment, any specific incident that make you think that? Um, I might respond to that, Chi. Um, can you hear me all right? Um, I was uh, pretty patriotic when I went to Vietnam, and I, um, I didn't have the experience of being an advisor, but I did, for the first six months I was there, I was largely around Da Nang and south of Da Nang, which at that time was pretty peaceful. Um, and it was obvious to us that there was a split in the villages between those that supported South Vietnam and those who were, would like to see a, a unification with North Vietnam or a just independence of some sort. Uh, so we had no guidance from the United States Marine Corps as to what to do, but we attempted to go into the villages um, and work with the villagers. I spoke French, which I had, had, had quite a bit of French, and there was a tremendous French influence in Vietnam at that time, particularly around the villages around Da Nang, uh, or any central area that had been 
um, it was more of a city or more more um, uh, suburbanized or urbanized. Um, and as a result of that, I tried to use my French um, somewhat failingly, but I would meet uh, every 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 type of Vietnamese from pure white Vietnamese to um, Vietnamese um, with normal uh, color. Um, and I realized that the white Vietnamese were either French, at that point there weren't Amerasians, um, but there were French Asians and there were many of them. And so what would happen when I went into a village is I would learn that the French school teacher was still in the village. Her school, of course, was gone. And I'd go talk with her, and she would tell me uh, her history, and I would try to gain her sympathy and try to gain support. To answer your question, about halfway through that process, about June of 1966, I realized that there was a change occurring, even in these small villages, that the more we went into the villages, the more the villages were turning against us. If, to the extent that there had been support, that support was ebbing pretty quickly. Uh, and one incident that I had that's in the book is I uh, was involved in some interrogation in May of 1966. Uh, and in those times, I realized that uh, it, this was not going to be a successful time for us and that it was only going to get worse. We couldn't possibly um, s gain the support of those villages. There was too much antipathy for the French originally and then us. The, um, <coughs> you're, when you're in the military, you're supposed to do what you're told. And we were told uh, we were going to form this free fire zone and we'd go on search and destroy missions and anything that lived inside of that was fair game and we were supposed to kill it. And that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I just r I related to you earlier the story of the, the final battle. But the, uh, I went into one village one time. We were receiving fire. To make a long story short. Went into the village after the fire stopped. Uh, there were no men around. There was one woman who was clearly the leader of the village. And uh, uh, she was chewing, uh, nuke mom, uh, chewing beetle nut, and she was pregnant. And so I went to her with my translator. I said, where? Where are the men? There are no men here. Who was shooting at us? I didn't, I didn't hear any shooting. She was defiant, just defiant. There must have been maybe 30 people there, women and children. And I said, well, where are the men? No men. Well, who made you pregnant? And I had my jump wings and my captain's bars and my combat infantryman's badge on my uniform. And she looked at me and grinned and said, American Airborne Captain. Uh, she was just defiant. And so we, we evacuated her, we burned her village, we evacuated her and all of her, killed her chickens, her and all of her colleagues and kids, back to the refugee camp, burned her village down, killed all of her animals, and shipped her rice store back to the refugee camp. And, and it was clear to me at that point that we were never, ever, ever going to convince that woman that what we were doing was the right thing. It was, and slowly but surely after that, it, it was, just became clear. And Tet was the final thing. After Ted, it was clear we were we were done for. Any other comments from the panel? Uh, with me, it was about 15 minutes after I was in country. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were briefed. Uh, I came in, and and uh, as uh, Ed said, we were. Uh, that was the middle of uh, Tet 1968. Uh, we were rushed to the MACV headquarters, and we were told that uh, the reason we were there was the domino theory, and China was going to move down through Vietnam and uh, penetrate uh, down into the southern, uh, the southern port and into Singapore and, and Australia, etc. Uh, that didn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, uh, that may have been true, that kind of thinking may have been true back in 1955, but at that particular time, it was 1968, uh, a lot had happened, a lot had changed. It was reinforced absolutely uh, when I got into the, the village that I, w that I was in and spent time with, uh, to spend time with the Vietnamese. 
Um, you'll read in my essay a, a man who, and I'll go ahead and say it because some of you perhaps haven't read it, but it, uh, we were out on an operation and I was sit, uh, squatted alongside of the road uh, and an old man came up and offered me food, <laughs> offered me rice. And I asked him, why are you giving me the rice? And he said, so you won't kill me. And I thought about that for a minute, and I said, uh, Viet Cong come at night? He said, yes. I said, do you give them rice? He said, yes. Mm -hmm. Same reason? Yes. And basically, the people wanted peace. Um, as I said earlier, this was, a, this was a civil war we were involved in. And, and, and Clearly, and I, I can't remember whether it was Butter, one of the others that, that mentioned this, you know, if we're going to go into a conflict, if we're going to go into a war, let's make sure that the war that we go into, and it's important that we defend ourselves, it's important that, that we do the kinds of things that are necessary to bring freedom across to all people that we possibly can, but let's make sure that we select a mission, a reason that is absolute and clear in our minds is the right thing to do. Uh, that clearly happened in the Second World War. Uh, Vietnam was not the same. I had uh, <coughs> a, a different kind of experience uh, altogether than from what Neil was dealing with. <coughs> My unit was attached to the 9th Infantry Division. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, I was in the artillery. It, we did not have direct contact with um, with the South Vietnamese people as part of our mission. Uh, I mean, we had incidental contact from time to time. Um, but one thing that became clear to me over time is that <coughs> the U.S. Army had free reign during the day and the Viet Cong had free reign at night. And that was the case when I arrived there and that was the case when I left there. Um, I saw no improvement, so I, I can't say there was any one particular um, instance, but, um, you know, uh, despite the number of troops that were pouring in to the country, um, it wasn't altering the situation in any, any significant way. Another question, Alex? <coughs> Thank you so much. So it's come up a couple times, but uh, in, in Professor Miller's History 26, kind of one of the things that, that we've noticed, especially looking at both the military and the civilian leadership in the U.S. at the time, is that they were, many of them were of basically the World War II generation, and many of them had served in, in World War II. I'd be curious in, in your experiences, both in dealing with uh, commanding officers in the military and potentially uh, parents or sort of adult authority figures in the civilian world, was there a sense of a sort of generational divide between the World War II generation and your generation? And did that in any way influence uh, the sort of the context of what was being said uh, about serving, uh, given the fact that there were so many older folks who'd served in a very different conflict? Thanks. Yes. Neil may be tone deaf, but I'm totally deaf. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll repeat the question. So Alex's question is uh, about World War II. And of course, uh, many of the, uh, the, the men and some of the women who are the generation of your parents had experience serving in World War II. And the question is, uh, in your experience in the military with commanding officers or perhaps with your parents or other authority figures in your life, um, was the experience of World War II relevant and important um, to you in, in your interactions with those people? Did I get it right? To me, no. I, I had no influence from second, the Second World War on my personal situation whatsoever. But the, the, we have to remember that it was an entirely different kind of war. When we went to Germany, we were trained to fight the war in Germany. Uh, we had tanks and armored personnel carriers and C-130s and, and uh, 
M14 rifles and things like that. When we went to Vietnam, we had helicopters and M16s. It was an entirely <coughs> different kind of war. In, Ger in World War II, there were lines. In Vietnam, my company was sometimes 25 miles away from the nearest friendly units. It was, we were independent operating units. And uh, so it was an entirely different kind of war. In World War II, we won. And I think there developed in the country uh, an attitude that we're omnipotent, that we can, if we want to, we can just go blow the bejesus out of anybody we want to. And uh, th those people were unwilling to accept the fact that we might get whopped or even consider the, the possibilities. There was one other problem, and that is that there was some distance between the end of the Korean War and the real buildup of the troops starting in, say, 66 in Vietnam. And so the, the field grade officers, the majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels, had not had any combat experience at all. And, the, the, and they didn't, when we were there, for the most part either. They were in su fire support bases, protected by bunkers, in a perimeter, uh, telling people like me and some of the rest of us what to do when they didn't have any personal experience about it themselves. And at least in my case, a few times, that created some difficulties in, the, in that they, they really didn't understand the chain of command uh, understand that the, what Lee says, you've got to trust the guys underneath you to do the job uh, because they'd had, they'd had no experience whatsoever. I think some of my battalion officers were never shot at the whole time they were in Vietnam and that created some difficulties as, as well. I, I, think, uh, I think the answer is that the, that generation did not really have much impact on us at all. Um, I think most of us, uh, at least in the Marine Corps, felt that we were very much on our own. We were fighting a war that had never been fought by a military a branch of the United States. Um, we had no training for uh, this war, but we knew, at least in the Marine Corps and I think all the services, that we were um, determined people. We could do what we wanted to do. Uh, successfully if we put our minds to it. So we looked to each other and we depended on each other. And as I said at the outset, that dependence on people you don't know and trust in people you don't know, it, to me, is a key to life because it, it, what it taught me is that a very small group of people, if they band together and trust one another, can do an awful lot of things. Now, you, to get to that realization, you have to put the Vietnam conflict, you have to put war aside, and you have to look at human nature and say that. Uh, the only thing I would say about the influence of World War II is I, I think Korea had a huge impact, and those uh, folks who had served in Korea, and I served with some <coughs> of them, um, really believed initially in the concept that we could stop the North Vietnamese from coming south, and they thought the strategy these are military commanders, thought the strategy was good and as good as Korea. <coughs> and most people who had been in Korea, although we settled for an armistice and not a total victory and all of that, thought we were successful in Korea. Korea was uh, a war where people didn't uh, think we lost the war. Um, and so the outcome that we were seeking and <coughs> mission I understood when I went there was to come out as, as well or better than Korea. Uh, that influenced, I think, everybody up to the President of the United States. I, I really do believe that. So maybe that's a partial answer to your question. Um, I, I did have um, a, a, a personal experience with that. My father was a, uh, a World War II vet. <coughs> he, um, he entered the war rather rather late, so he didn't see any combat action, and he, he was in the Navy. Um, but he, when I, when I got my orders for Vietnam, he, he had very mixed feelings about that himself at that point. But where the conflict came is when I became anti-war after the war and came back in graduate school, um, he didn't really understand where I was coming from and um, we weren't really able to communicate uh, with each other about it because he did have <coughs> um, you know a totally different attitude um, toward the role of the military and in, in the geopolitical 
uh, theater and um, and it was just um, there was we just couldn't mesh. We could we could we could not have a conversation about it. My case was a little bit different than than Bud's. Uh, my father was also in the Second World War and and, and fought in the Second World War. Uh, he was still in the reserves. He was a lieutenant colonel in the reserves at that time. Uh, when I got my letters to Vietnam, he said, you've served your time. In fact, went on to say, if you want to go to Canada, it's okay with me. Um, you you got to remember, uh, unlike today, in the Vietnam War was played out on television every single night at home. Um, you watched people getting killed. Um, you know, we we reported body counts every single day, whether they were right or wrong, you reported them. It was, it was a completely different environment, even from what we have today. We have reports about what's going on in Afghanistan or what was going on at Fallujah, et cetera, but you didn't see it on television to the extent that you saw it um, in, in the 60s. Very, very different environment, very different time. But the conflicts, you know, Bud's dad, my dad, two different, you know, both in similar situations, but you can't answer the question uh, with a blanket. It, yeah. Very, very difficult. The question, yeah, Emily. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm an 18, so a freshman, and I have a question for Mr. Kendall. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your candor, firstly. Um, and it seems by what you've said that you became pretty anti-war in the midst of the war. And I wondered if you were in the minority in that or if you felt as though the people you were fighting with felt that too. I, I don't think I was, I, I continued my, my year in Vietnam and I met my contractual commitments to the army. It, becoming a pacifist was a, was a slower process. And I don't think, and I'm not a total pacifist now. I believe in a strong military, for example. But the uh, becoming so opposed to war uh, took years, actually, for me to finally think that through thoroughly. Um, I and mean, then we were talking early about these, these soldiers that I served with were 18 years old, 19 years old. And they, they were not well-educated, and they were not particularly... Um, acceptable candidates to go to Dartmouth, if you understand what I mean. They, they were not intellectual in any way. And uh, th th I don't know that they had enough knowledge and enough motivation to really <coughs> become anti-war while, while they were there. I'm sure some did, but it, it was not a problem for us at all. Uh, as I said, most of the infantrymen just complain, and they, uh, they do that very well. Uh, but they did their job, and I did my job as we went along. There's, there is a sense of obligation. If you say you're going to do something, then you need to finish that out somehow. I subsequently have reflected some on when I decided that that was a stupid war and I submitted my resignation. I, perhaps if I'd been more courageous or more convinced, I would have gone AWOL and gone to Canada or something to express my opinion. I didn't do that. And that may have been somewhat cowardly. I don't know. I haven't dug deep enough into that one to think it through. And, and I'm not sure I really want to. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, I'm a 17. Um, and I want to ask, uh, how has the United States government addressed the physical and psychological damages that you suffered during the war? And have you been able to forgive the government for subjecting you to these injuries um, while engaging in such a seemingly pointless conflict. Jim, you need to answer that. Well, the, the impact of the war on me was profound because I am a victim of the contamination p caused by Agent Orange and the chemical dioxin, which is the most powerful negative molecule ever known to mankind. I deal with that problem every day. In order to get through this interview, I have to take cinema every two hours so that I can control my arm movements. And I'm adjudicated 100% disabled 
by the Veterans Administration. I gloated when I left Vietnam because I went through 77 low-altitude aerial reconnaissance missions without a scratch, but I guess I was guilty of the ancient Greek pride of hubris, and it caught up to me. In, any other comments from the panel in response to Ben's question? Um, I, I guess I could comment on, um, <clears throat> I don't know <clears throat> whether um, the appropriate response is to forgive uh, the government. <clears throat> I do wish they'd get smarter. Um, <laughs> um, and I mean, uh, we, World War II was such a different war and most of the wars that we've gotten involved in since then uh, have been civil wars. And you would think we would learn, you know, after you make a mistake or two. But we keep getting ourselves embroiled <coughs> in, uh, in these civil wars and, uh, and sometimes wars with religious components to it. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at the situation in Afghanistan, for instance, um, the British failed there, the Russians failed there. What made us think we would be successful there? Um, and uh, one of the things that I am involved in in my academic life is in the study of uh, um, in Ireland, and, and particularly um, I focused on uh, Northern Ireland in a lot of my research. <clears throat> it took the British 700 years to pacify Ireland. And it's still, right, is <laughs> not 100% pacified. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we keep turning over generation after generation of politicians, and uh, the same level of naivete seems to crop up in each generation. And... I, you know, specifically though, I think things are getting better. Uh, clearly, the the psychological effects uh, of, of wartime is are better treated today than they were when we came out of the service in 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 the 60s or 70s. Uh, the the diseases, the the psychological impact is is the same, uh, but we're learning to do more with it. Uh, and that's got to continue. It's got to be expanded, and it's got to grow. Uh, it, it impacts every single one of us. Anyone that's been in combat has a residual effect of that. You can, you can say, no, no, I, you know, I'm fine. Everything's okay. But it'll still come back. And in <coughs> fact, we were sitting there talking about some things last night uh, with some recent vets, and they still wake up about it. And Lee and I were talking about it earlier. We still think about it today, not to the extent that we did, you know, 30 years ago, but clearly, you know, as Lee said, I think about it, some days I think I'm getting orders back to Vietnam, um, and I wake up in a sweat. There's a, sorry, want to go? Yeah, let me say something. I, I guess there's two levels to the, um, the question. Um, I've come to the realization that from a political perspective, if you look, you, you all just studied Kennedy, Johnson, um, uh, in Westmoreland and all the advisors, and you've just gone through those uh, sessions in your class. And what I've come to believe from a longer point of view is that there's an awful lot of influence of the personality who is at the top of the chain of command here, the President of the United States and his advisors. Uh, and that has more to do with us going to war or not going to war. It seems um, a very difficult way for our country to proceed. And, uh, but I don't think anything in my lifetime or your lifetime is going to change that because it's always going to be dependent in part on personality and secondly, on developed policy by advisors and the influences that that um, uh, uh, results in. Um, 
I guess that's all I'd say at the moment. I, I have my, my standard rant about this. Um, uh, starting in about 1968, vets were complaining, those exposed to Agent Orange, that they were having uh, deformed children and weird forms of cancer. We see one advance of some, uh, ad, one example of it here. And the VA denied that there was any problem, and they denied it, and they denied it until 1993. I don't know when you guys got it. In 1993, we got a letter from the Veterans Administration that if you have one of the following 47 maladies, you qualify for dis, for to be disabled because of what happened to you uh, with exposure to Agent Orange. It, it took, and by that time, a lot of people were dead and families were ruined. When these, these uh, soldiers, these 18-year-old guys came back from Vietnam, they had the, the uh, GI Bill, the Veterans Administration contracted it out to a bunch of uh, unethical contractors. They were trained to be mechanics or school teachers or they were trained to do something, but at the end of the training, they'd spent their GI Bill and they weren't trained to do a damn thing. And the Veterans Administration didn't do anything about it. it, it the, if you went to San Francisco in 19, 1985, Market Street was full of homeless Vietnam veterans. And the VA was trying a bit to help them, but there were hundreds of homeless Vietnam veterans on the streets because they didn't have any confidence in the system to support them at all. Now, things have gotten a lot better since then, uh, but we cannot ever forget that that happened by our government not taking care of the warriors who fought the war. And you can oppose the war and support the warriors. Uh, uh, you must all the time, all the time. And we can't forget that it happened before. And one final thing, I, I'm still not at all happy with the suicide rates of the current veterans. That is a national disaster that needs to be fixed. Another question. Yes, right up here in the second row. Uh, John Griffith, I'm a senior. Um, regarding something that Mr. Kendall said before, um, what he was speaking to, a lot of you guys came to the realization uh, early on in the war that you had some kind of moral confliction with being there. Um, and I guess I'm basically wondering how you kept making the decisions that you had to make um, despite having those moral conflictions. How did you overcome kind of what was going on in your head without like putting your soldiers and your mission at risk? I, I can start with that, and it's really, it, it starts and ends with what you just said. Uh, you have a mission, and you have those soldiers, and you are responsible for them, and you are going to carry that through for them. Uh, you can't abandon them. As, uh, if you're their commander, if you're the, the officer or NCO that's, that's in charge of that unit, you need to take care of those people. You know, we, we talk about war in a global perspective, and that's what you're learning in History 26. You're looking at that. War is not about the global perspective. When you're, when you're sitting, sitting and, and being shot at, you're not worried about what the president is doing or what Congress is doing or whether or not you're moral, it's morally correct to be there. Your concern is whether or not you're going to survive that particular attack and how, more importantly, how are you going to survive uh, have all of your, your men survive w along with you. That's what you're concerned about. Um, the other part of it was, uh, you know, for us, we were fortunate enough, we could come back at the end of the year. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking with my Vietnamese ca uh, counterparts, uh, and they would always say the same thing. Uh, you know, Dai Hui, uh, you'll go home at the end of this year. Uh, I'm still here, and my family is still here. Um, I think that what happens, um, war is, 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 there's no glamour t to any of this. And what you end up doing uh, as time goes on is you end up depending to a greater degree on each other. And you don't think about anything else but relying on another person to keep you alive and they think the same way you do. And the more that happens, um, the better your success will be. Um, all the rest of it, I don't think anybody thinks about. At least I didn't. 
maybe just a little bit about being 26 years old in command of 160 guys 25 miles away from anybody else with people shooting at you. Uh, once you go through the baptism of fire, and we, we all just became old men. Uh, we were not, we're not a bunch of kids. We were not, I wasn't 26. I was 66. I was uh, something else. And your focus, your focus changes. It, it, uh, it's true. You're not concerned about one kilometer from here. You're concerned about the next five feet. And you're concerned about is Jones okay over here and is what Smith doing over here, and how are we gonna? What are we gonna do next? How are we going to get through this as safely as we can and do what it is that we're supposed to do? And your focus doesn't come down to, to moral judgments very often. It's, it's much more about just getting the job done. And uh, that was enough to keep your attention most of the time, except those few times when you got to reflect upon it. Um, and again, I think, I suppose, if I had been as courageous as I suppose I could have been, I should have, when I realized it was a, it was a stupid war, I should have done something to state my, my, my dissatisfaction with it. I didn't. I resigned. I didn't go to Canada. I didn't uh, go AWOL. I didn't do any of those things that I could have done. Um, I, I guess I'll be thinking about that now that you guys have brought it up. So, <laughs> thank you. I, I think uh, <clears throat> a, a lot of the views that you're getting from us are, are you know, somewhat retrospective. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as the others have been saying, uh, when you're in the middle of something, you just focus on what you need to do. And um, uh, part of it is, is training, but I mean, you <clears throat> when you have to react fast, you, you rely on that training, you rely on your, your reflexes, and you can't stop to say, is this what I really want to do? Uh, that's not the time to do it. I mean, you just you do your job. Um. Another question? Yes, in the third row here. It's Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm at 18. Um, a couple of you wrote about the Vietnam Memorial, and I was wondering what um, personally the memorial means to you, and also if you think it means something about the change in American society. The okay. question was about the Vietnam. Uh, I'll Memorial start off with that in Washington. And, and uh, Neil, let me let me just repeat yeah. the question for Go Jim. Ahead. Yeah, it's the question was about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington and and what it means to to each of you and what if if you think it's reflective of any changes or, or shifts in U.S. society. I'll answer the first part of that, which is the what it means, and I think ev every one of us feel the same way. Um, First of all, I didn't talk about my experience in Vietnam uh, at all uh, when I came home. Um, and my wife uh, is from Washington, D.C., and about 15 years later, uh, we were jogging in Rock Creek Park, and she, <coughs> this breaks me up a little bit, but uh, she convinced me uh, to jog over to the uh, Lincoln Memorial, and she said, well, well, while we're here, why don't, why don't you go down and uh, go to the Vietnam Memorial? And I said, I don't want to. She said, come on. And we went down. And it, it was a catharsis for me at that particular point in time. It was very, very difficult. I found the men that I served with that had died, that had served under me and had died. Um, it was extremely hard, but it was a very necessary thing. And that memorial... It, it, it means that to every veteran that's there, every vet veteran that was there. It's, it symbolizes for us the sacrifices that were made, even in spite of the fact that we may not have believed in the war. We may not have fought for something that, uh, that was important, that we felt was important to us. It was a sacrifice that we made, and, and that's why it was important to us. And, and yeah, I, th I think it's... A, it's Politically, it's a very important thing for us to do. It's important to remember, as, as we said, it's important to remember the warriors that were there because they've sacrificed a lot, a tremendous amount. It took me about 10 years before I was able to go down and see the Vietnam Memorial. And 
if, if for those of you who haven't seen it, it's the most striking monument that I think exists in the world. The, this country was ripped apart by the Vietnam War. And I think that the advent of that memorial and the healing effect it's had on our population is extremely important. I've been to the wall a number of times. One of the names on that wall is one of our classmates, Bruce Nickerson. The other, another name I'm familiar with was my immediate commanding officer who was killed when I was with the Aerial Reconnaissance Unit in the Mekong Delta. And as Neil has pointed out, it, it, it symbolizes the sacrifice of every one of those men. I had a kind of a <coughs> contradictory experience about the wall when I first read about uh, what they were going to do for uh, a, a, a war memorial for the Vietnam War. I, s I said, a wall? Is that all we get is a wall? Uh, but then when I saw it, uh, when I was there, it, it, was, it was profoundly moving. And, um, I, and part of it is the simplicity of it. Um, and it, um, I didn't expect to be moved when I s when the first time I went there, and, and uh, it was profoundly moving. I marched in the parade for the dedication of the wall. Um, I campaigned to raise money for the wall. I agree with uh, what my colleagues have said about it. It's uh, uh, the uh, Bruce's name, for example, is uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, moving, as you can see, uh, because we all knew him, and many of the men that served with me's names on it. It's wonderful. Another question? Yes, Sandor. Hi, my name is Sandor. I'm a 17, so a sophomore. I'm wondering, well, so the anti-ROTC protests have been brought up a lot, the occupation of Parkhurst. And I'm wondering first what it felt like to be the target of those protests as cadets in ROTC. And second, what place you think ROTC continues to have on college campuses? I, I was here when it happened. Uh, I never ex experienced any personal abuse. Uh, some, but I, I was at Tuck, and I hid down in the basement where the computer room was and just worked and pretended and just let it go by. Um, I observed today, I think the Dartmouth anti-war protesters were um, uh, not the most uh, active, uh, what's the right word, destructive, uh, um, radical of many of the protesters in the country. There, there was almost no damage to Parkhurst, for example, when they were occupying the building. Um, the, the, uh, I don't think that President Kennedy had any choice but to, to shut down ROTC at the time. It was, there was no other choice to do it. As far as the role of ROTC, and I can't judge. I hope it grows and it gets big and we get a lot of Dartmouth people in the military and the military is strong so that uh, we can keep them under control and we don't get into stupid wars anymore. Any other thoughts on this question? I just like to. S <coughs> I agree with with Glenn on the um, ROTC. I think it's important uh, to get um, you know college graduates uh, into the uh, into the military. And I know it's a, a very controversial to topic, but I'm one of the people who who feels that uh, the draft is a positive thing and it should be reinstituted because I think that we'll be a lot more careful about the kinds of conflicts that we get into if everyone is uh, susceptible to serving. Boy, he just brought up a subject that would have a lot of discussion right here at the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, okay. Another question, see you on. Hi, I'm Sion and I'm a 16. Um, so many of you expressed uh, discontent as to how the U.S. government um, made decisions to get involved in Vietnam and how it treated uh, veterans. And since the assumption of the 
this start with education is that um, its students are going to be leaders of this country and wherever they're all from. So um, how do you guys have any advice as to like what Dartmouth students can take away from their Dartmouth experience or how they can take more advantage of this experience in terms of um, how they will become leaders of these nations and like make big decisions in the future? Uh, okay, go ahead. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> You, get, you guys are great. Uh, just keep it up. Keep, keep the intensity. That's, that's the most important thing. Keep the intensity. Use your heads and keep the intensity. Don't, don't slack off. Just keep, keep on trucking. You'll be fine. I'll add to that is, is one of the things that is really important is be observant. Don't, don't, polar, don't take a polarized view of something that is going on, whether it's in the world or in this country, without thoroughly investigating the facts behind the case. Uh, I find that, that that's, uh, that's what your education is here for. That's what, you're, that's what you're learning. Do not make a snap decision. Understand what went on behind the scenes to make this particular event or this, this situation exist and make the decisions based with knowledge, not, not so much with heart or emotion. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to do and you get wrapped up in it, but the, you, you have to fight to keep yourself out of those particular kinds of situations. That's what your education is for. That's what you should be doing. And it, it plays out not just in, in, in a, a military or political con uh, context, It'll play out if you go into business or a newer profession. It's the same thing there. Make sure that you examine things fully and make your decisions based on facts. Yeah, the, the comment I would add is that, that um, we never had the kind of courses that's being offered here in History 26. And I guess I'm a pie-eyed optimist, but I believe that what's, um, what, what may take place a little bit in this world is that people will become, make themselves more informed on the selection of their leaders. And over time may force those leaders to think through some of these decisions. Um, whether that will lessen war over time, um, I mean, th I think statistically war is, has lessened, but what it means for leadership of this country uh, is dependent on all of you and many others. And some despair that we're, are, we're losing our civic involvement, but I, I don't know that that's true. The advent of technology and the advent of the interchanges that occur, um, I think people are pretty smart and they hopefully will control our leaders and make them do the right thing. Another question? Yes, in the back, Billy. Hi. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's your, a little lighter. Your name, please. Uh, my name is Billy. I'm an 18. Um, a lot of us, our only exposure to Vietnam has been through war films, so my question is going to be about that. Um, all of you have talked about how difficult it was to discuss the war immediately afterwards, and I was wondering if you've seen Vietnam war films like Apocalypse Now, Platoon, um, and if so, when did you see them, and what was that experience like? And on top of that, which Vietnam War film do you think best captures the feeling of being in war? The, the question was about Vietnam War films, because this is the way that, that many young people today encounter Vietnam, at least for the first time. And are there any particular Vietnam War films you've seen? Uh, when did you see them? What was your reaction? And is there any particular film that you've seen about Vietnam that you think uh, best captures the experience that you had being there? I think a film that you all should watch if it's available to you is currently available on Netflix called Vietnam in HD. It's actual pho photographic footage taken f f from the beginning of the advisory period in the late 1950s through the fall of Vietnam in April of 1975. Much of the footage is in color and it's pretty graphic. And it's, 
it's, it's, it's the, the full story and is going to bear out a lot of the things you've heard us discuss tonight. I, I never went into combat to Beethoven. <coughs> <laughs> I think it was, it was Wagner. Oh, it was, Va it was I'm sorry, it was Wagner, yes. I never went into combat. I did several hellebore assaults, <laughs> but Wagner was never playing. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it's, it, 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 I guess it's all we've got. I, th I think the Corporation for Public Broadcasting did a series uh, some time ago in the Vietnam War that it seemed to capture it pretty well. Rumor has it that um, somebody's going to be coming out with even a better one that maybe our, our professor had something to do with. I'm really, an <laughs> really anticipating wow. that one. Uh, so, um, but be careful of the ones that sort of glorify the war or you know, make it into entertainment because it's not. Um, a couple of films that um, that I saw. I didn't see many films um, for for quite a while, um, but uh, the <coughs> and then I started to look at some of the some of the Vietnam War films, and I think there were two really that. Um, had a uh, significant impact on me. And one of them was All of the Stones, but not Platoon. It was Born on the Fourth of July that um, captured the, the sweep of getting, you know, sort of caught up in the war and then the anti-war sentiment that, that followed there. I was fortunate not to have been injured in the way that the protagonist in that film was. Um, but uh, the sweep of emotions that was characterized in that film uh, was very close to my own. Um, and another film that I found very powerful um, was The Deer Hunter. And I think that the, <coughs> the metaphor of uh, the Russian roulette uh, in that film, even though that was not what you would call a common experience in the Vietnam War or any other war, but as a metaphor, I thought that was a very powerful uh, metaphor for the kind of uh, dehumanization process that takes place uh, in any, you know, sort of combat situation. I mean, you, you typically, uh, in a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, people get through the war by dehumanizing the enemy their krauts, their sled eyes, their towel heads, et cetera, okay? Uh, they're not real people for them. Or in some cases, they dehumanize themselves. Uh, the Gomer Pyle figure in uh, Full Metal Jacket, for instance. Um, but uh, that's a very common defense mechanism, I think, um, for warfare is that that dehumanization process, and I thought that that was an extremely powerful metaphor uh, for it. Because you're talking, you're getting this from a literature professor, of course. <laughs> uh, from a personal vantage point, I couldn't watch any of those films, Deer Hunter, Apocalypse Now, or Platoon, uh, for a long time, and I still won't probably watch those. It's similar to, I had trouble reading a lot of the more sensational books that were written about Vietnam. What I've, what I've found is that over the decades, the kinds of things that are being produced, the kinds of things that are being written are far more accurate over time. We're really beginning to learn the history um, and, and, and relive it a little bit. So I'm encouraged when Ken Burns comes out with his series, I think we'll be pretty excited. I think that will probably be as accurate a, a, a um, portrayal of the war that this country's seen. And so maybe a lot of this, my concerns will go away. Question? Yes, Joe. Uh, hi, my name's Joe. I'm a senior in History 26. Um, so all of you have so far expressed extreme discontent with the way that the Vietnam War was handled, the fact that it happened at all. Um, but Mr. Stanley also mentioned in your introduction the fact that uh, 
Vietnam today is stable. Vietnam today is our ally. Um, and I wonder if any of you, I suspect the answer is no, but I'm still curious. Um, I wonder if any of you have had uh, any found in retrospect, any sort of pride um, in the mission that you were involved in there um, or found any sort of uh, anything positive that happened in kind of a political sense uh, from our involvement in Vietnam? Um, I, I would say that the answer to that is yes. The, um, I started to get reinvolved in this uh, during, as I say in the book, it, during Marine Week, which occurred in 2012 <coughs> in Cleveland. It was the first time Cleveland had ever had a Marine Week. It's been held in a number of cities. And when I looked upon the qualifications of the young Marines, all of whom were the age I was when I went, went into Vietnam, I took a great deal out of pride, uh, not only for who they are, but who we were at, at that time. Um, what happened to us uh, is maybe an aberrance of history in the sense that it's the only time I know of where the country didn't honor its military heroes and military folk uh, to the same degree it, it, it was opposed to the war. Maybe, maybe the Revolutionary War or one other war was <coughs> like that, but I, I'm not aware of it, and maybe this is for Ed Miller, not me. Um, but I think the, there's a lot to be gotten out of uh, wars like Vietnam. I commanded, um, at times, a thousand troops. I helped those troops get GEDs. Those troops went on and became successful uh, in, the, in business and learned life skills that they never had. So with all the negative that you hear about all of this, I think there's a positive side. And I, I feel very strongly that the experience can be a positive one. Nobody likes war, and I'm not in favor of war, but that doesn't mean I'm anti-war. Um, we just had the wrong political leaders uh, for that one. I'm sorry, Lee, but I don't quite agree with you about it. I think we need to think about what it would have been like if we'd not had the war and what would have happened in an alternative history. And uh, uh, perhaps the, the war wasn't necessary to achieve what you're talking about, which is wonderful. But um, the, it, it, for me, it was, um, I, I can see no, I'm glad I'm alive. Uh, I guess uh, I, I'm proud that I served my country, but uh, I would have preferred not to have had the experience in retrospect. Another question? Yeah, very. Uh, hi, I'm Very. I'm a 16, and I'm really interested in Vietnam today. If you've considered going back, if you, Mr. Stanley, have kept up your Vietnamese, mm -hmm. or if um, <laughs> you have any, <laughs> or if you have any desire to, or and why and why not. Well, as a matter of fact, some of us are going back in November with Professor Miller, so <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, you know, y the answer is yes. I unfortunately can't go back uh, this year, but I do plan on going back in the future. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, I was it Jim or Bud, someone was talking about the, the economic development in, in the country, it's, it's huge. They're, uh, while they're not a close ally, uh, they clearly are there. Uh, the, uh, you know, my daughter has been there a couple of times and, and really has told me a lot about the, the economic development in, inside the country. So I think it's a very positive thing that, that what has occurred and, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to get back, in, back there again. Uh, if you'd asked me that question 15 years ago, the answer would be absolutely no. I never want to go back again. But that's not the case today. Another question? Jack. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm a 15. Um, so I have a question for you, Neil. 
Um, I know a lot of times uh, when I'm hearing about conflicts or disasters, uh, and, and often, oftentimes people say, uh, you know, if only we had uh, talked to the people involved. So I guess in the Vietnam War, it would have been, you know, the Vietnamese involved in the Civil War. And I'm wondering if um, any interactions that you had, um, because it sounds like you had many interactions with the Vietnamese, um, if those interactions um, influenced your feelings about the war while you were serving? Oh, absolutely, uh, they did. Um, the, you, you get to know the people. Um, and, and as I said earlier, it, it really comes down to what, what they really wanted. You understood what they wanted, and what they wanted was peace. Uh, the war was really controlled. They, they were doing things that they were told to do as well. Um, the, the South Vietnamese government, uh, for the most part, was corrupt. Um, I, I said that in my opening statement about the province chief, but it really ran down to, to others. It, the, their, families, uh, their families needed to be protected. They were there. They, they, they had really no choice but to continue to fight. Um, one of the problems that we had, and I'll, I'm not answering the question specifically, but it'll give you a, a, a better perspective of it. Uh, when you were leading, you were in battle with the, the Vietnamese. Uh, often, they would not want to fight. Um, uh, you know, you'd want to take a position, and they, they wouldn't want to take that position because they would have casualties as a result of that. Um, unfortunately, <coughs> Our commanding officer was up in a helicopter above us most of the time, and he'd command the advisors to uh, take over where they would not go. Um, and I lost some friends in that, that kind of an environment. But the answer is you know, th those, those people uh, really just wanted uh, a peaceful resolution to, what, to the war that they had, not so much for the senior command for everything, the, the junior officers, and, and certainly down in, into the lower, uh, the lower enlisted people. Another question? Yeah, Chileta. Hi, I'm Chileta, a 17 in History 26. And in reading a lot of the essays from the book, it's a lot of your classmates were talking about um, knowing people who were able to avoid going to Vietnam. And I was wondering how you felt about men of your generation who were able to avoid going, those who were sort of able to opt in, and those that were drafted, and how that informed your service. Let, let me restate the question. The question concerns um, avoidance of service, which of course became very common as the Vietnam War went on. There were various methods and and tactics that, that American men use to, to get out of serving in Vietnam. And, and what's your feeling of, about that practice? That's correct. I don't know if I can speak for my colleagues, but that was not an option in my family. My parents were violently opposed to the Vietnam War, but they would have been mortified if I had not served my commitment to the military. I felt that I did a good job and that I related well with my men and they to me. And I was not about to go to Canada because I passed the bar examination in New Jersey. And <laughs> I wasn't about to go through that again. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think any one of us uh, held anything against people that, that it was a personal decision. Uh, if, if someone felt in their own mind that they they needed to object, and whether that was going to Canada or using some other type of deferment, uh, that was that was perfectly acceptable, um, and and I, I certainly didn't hold anything against anyone that didn't do it. Is it my personal decision to go? Uh, that was mine. Others had other choices to make. Yeah, I also <coughs> did not feel any particular antagonism toward uh, people who. Uh, um, took another method of avoiding the draft, um, and um, and it was, you know, in my own in my own case, I had made a commitment, and uh, you know, I I would not have chosen to go to Canada or 
you know, burn my draft card in uh, in any case, um, no matter how much I, you know, disapproved of, uh, you know, what happened over there. You know, it's interesting that I, I listened to this. And I was thinking about this uh, myself. It, it sounds contradictory, doesn't it? You know, we, we, uh, we don't have any problem with people who didn't do it, but we just followed and we don't agree. We didn't agree with the war, and yet we continued to do the things that we did. We continued to fight. We continued, we continued to uh, do what we felt was the honorable thing to do. Uh, it sounds like a contradiction. Yet, uh, and I, it, even as I'm saying it, I think that. Uh, but when you're living it on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you're there, you're in the midst of what you're doing. Um, maybe you just rationalize your way out of it, uh, and maybe, uh, I know in my particular case, I took it day by day. Uh, I, I really, what I wanted to do was get home, uh, and I wanted the people that I, I served with to get home with me. That's what was most important. Nothing else mattered at that particular point in time in my life. You're right. It was, it was a contradiction. I mean, we were living a contradiction. Yeah. My, my best friend in high school <coughs> went to Stanford, burned his draft card, and spent four years in prison. Uh, I have as much respect for him for standing up the way he did as, as otherwise. I think there's one factor, though, I mentioned it a bit earlier. There was sort of an institutional piece of it, uh, and there's been a lot of research about this, I know, in that the... Uh, I have to be careful how I say this. The lower income, uh, less educated, um, mostly people of color, ended up being the cannon fodder in the process. And that, it would, I don't know if it was explicitly racism, but it comes pretty damn close. And I think we really need to take a look at that kind of a policy that that if we're going to have a burden, we need to share it equally amongst all of us and not let people who have some privilege uh, do the good work and the, the other folks do the skunk work. And, and I think in Vietnam, that's what happened. It's in my company, as I said, that we were about 90% people of color. And uh, uh, that certainly doesn't reflect the proportions of the population. They were good soldiers, though. One thing, uh, I guess we're getting into a conversation about the draft, but w what I would say is I've had the opportunity to work with Vietnam or um, Iraq and Afghan veterans uh, through the Marine Corps, um, and I can't tell you how proud I am of the service that these men and women have given, and I do think that the service, um, because it's volunteer, um, is less in a position than it was during the Vietnam era. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, there were a lot of, of, of folks that came into the service during Vietnam to escape their urban conditions that were in their uh, cities and, and, and towns. Um, that's still true, but at least it's, it's not, well, I'll go join the Army because I'm going to be drafted anyways. It's truly a voluntary uh, effort. And I, I think there's a difference. I just, I just feel it. And I, I meet these troops and see how much they've matured and grown up and learn about the backgrounds they came from. And in some cases, their backgrounds aren't as good as they were in the Vietnam era. But they're, they're being successful individuals. And I, I think the services have given a lot you know, there's a lot given <coughs> by the troops, but the service is given a lot. There's better training, there's better follow through, and I'm optimistic about all of that. We are past the allotted end of our time, so please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> <laughs>